My name is Alejandro. This is my second time telling the story. Uh, and um, here it is. The uh, emotion overwhelms me as I hop onto the bus. It's a particularly hot day and all the children around me are screaming from excitement. The air is damp and sweaty bodies touch each other as we board the bus. You can smell the body odor and it's so rank that you can't really breathe. It feels like a typical day in Havana. The bus is bound for Pinar del Rio and the last one of the day. And I'm particularly upset because I've always wanted to go to Pinar for the beach. So then I asked myself, why are we taking this last bus? Through the happiness of the passengers, all I can see is the worried look on my mom's face. Mami, ¿qué te pasa? What's wrong? She immediately barks back, ay, niño, cállate. Para de pelear. Para de preguntar preguntas. Stop asking questions and shut up. This response from my mom has become the norm for the last 15 months since my dad left us. My uncle tells us that my father left for a job in Santiago de Cuba, and my aunt says that he just left us for another woman. So my grandfather tells us that he'll be back any day now, and my grandmother, she actually can't really look at me when I ask her about it. It's hard to believe anyone these days as there's so many changes happening all around us. The Soviet Union has collapsed, Cuba's biggest aid following the embargo against us from the US. The food situation in Cuba is dire. The lines at the supermarket are long. People are haggling and they're screaming and they're waiting hours just to get some cafe, some arroz and some pan. My mom says it's because the government doesn't know what they're doing, but Honestly, all I really care about is having pan. I love bread. And so we spend most nights staring at news on the TV, watching the endless reports of people trying to escape Cuba and failing to do so. It's quite common to hear of bodies being found on the ocean, of those attempting to get to Miami. My brother says that the government is making it all up, that there's so much hysteria and information being disseminated and quite honestly, I didn't even know that fake news existed back then either. <laughs> My mother is quiet during the entire bus ride, and she says nothing but stares blankly into space. No expression, no talking, and I can tell that she's nervous, and so my brother and I look at each other with the something's going on look. The only word that she speaks is, estoy bien, I'm fine. And we both know that she's not fine. And so as we pass San Cristobal, my mom finally breaks her silence and says, abre las manos, open your hands. And so I, my brother begins to open his hands and she hands us two white pills for us to consume. My brother immediately does it, but I have questions. <laughs> what is this? Is this candy? Why does it look like a pill if it's candy? What is this? My mom's response is just simply a slap in my face and saying, cállate, and so I swallow. From this moment on, I can't recall much of the remaining hours. There's small glimpses of visions, and in one I'm being carried by my brother into a bush. The other, I hear him say, cállate, be quiet. Eventually I come to realize that my brother is holding me as he wipes blood from my nose, and we're on a boat. I can smell seawater and the smell of burnt tire all around us, and I hear my mom yelling. There's an older man with us, and they're two twin girls, and I recognize them. They're friends of my father. I hear more yelling, but I cannot quite understand what's being said. My head is pounding, and when I try to open my mouth, my mother just shoves two more white pills and says, swallow, you need to swallow. And so I do. And so I finally awake in the hospital bed with my brother sitting next to me. He's holding what appears to be a magazine with the words Florida on it. Where are we, I ask. He says, estamos en la Yuma. The word Yuma is, comes, is what Cubans refer to as the United States. So I say, what? He says, yes, we're going to go see Papi. We had arrived in Key West, Florida, and under the current law, any Cuban who touched land would be allowed to claim political asylum. We were one of those Cubans. Before I can comprehend what's happening, 
my mother walks into the room with a cop. And so I'm taken back by the image of what he's holding in his hand. It's a big, bright red can. And so the cop speaks some strange Spanish to my mom, and they begin to talk about where, what will happen to us and where we will go. They talk about some money that they will lend us and a refugee home which we will go to. Through all of this, the only thing that I can focus is that bright red can. And so I ask, what is that? He says, this, this is a Coke. And I said, what is Coke? <laughs> he laughs and he hands it to me and I take a sip. And I can't begin to explain to you the feeling I had when I had this Coke. <laughs> it was like a party in my mouth and I had never <laughs> tasted anything before in my life. And I asked, can I keep it? And he said, see, sí, you can have as many as you want. <laughs> and so I finally, with this response, I'm finally able to cry with so much overwhelming feeling. And so the next few days happen with a blur. My mother keeps arguing with the immigration people about where they will happen, why my dad hasn't come for us. To be honest, I don't really care. The smell of the US, the colors, the people, they're so white. <laughs> There's air conditioning everywhere. <laughs> and even now, the smell of new carpet brings me back to that time because I have never smelled carpet in my life. But I do remember, above all else, drinking Coke, this magical drink that some way represented comfort and freedom and new beginning. And so a few days later, my dad arrives, and there's a lot of crying, and my mom is screaming. And so we drive from Key West to Miami, and we walk into a 24-hour supermarket, and I just remember seeing all of that food. And there's food everywhere. <laughs> and I, I'm flabbergasted by seeing my brother and I run into the, you know, the candy by the pound section where you put the candy and you weigh it. And my dad begins to scream, no, no, you have to pay for that. And I say, pay? This is La Yuma, land of free. So I don't have to pay for this candy. And so as I shove the candy in my mouth, my dad begins to laugh. And as we pack what felt like 89 bags of groceries into the back of a Toyota Corolla, my dad begins to lecture us about being an American. And being an American means that you need to have expectations. And any immigrant will tell you that a parent's expectations of a child is very high. You need to get a job, go to school, speak English, bring your family from Cuba, meet a girl, have some kids, buy a house, buy a house for that girl, buy a house for your family, buy a house for your grandmother, <laughs> buy everybody a house, everybody needs a house. And so I quickly found out that maybe America wasn't really what it was cracked up to be. <laughs> and so it wasn't until high school that I began to see the crack in my parents' American dream. And so I knew early on that I was gay, but coming out to my parents would mean that a heartbreak for them. Not because they wouldn't accept who I was, but because I would never achieve the things that they wanted from me. And so they constantly reminded my brother and I that they had a difficult life here and not in Cuba. So in Cuba, my father was a professor of chemistry and my mom was a nurse. But here, he was a truck driver and my mom was unemployed. And not having English to continue their careers hurt them. And here I was, not appreciating any of that. Now, it's not that I didn't want all these things. It's that I wanted to create my own version of my American dream. And telling them that I was gay meant for me that I didn't appreciate all the things that they had sacrificed for my brother and I, that somehow I was disrespecting them and not being grateful for all they had given up to bring us here. And I asked myself, why can't I just be straight and give my parents what they want? So the day that I had that talk with my mom, was the week after I met my first boyfriend. I was, if anybody can recall their first boyfriend, you're so happy that you have someone. And so I was so happy and I felt really bad in my heart because I lied to her about it. So I decided to come clean to her. And so I said, mommy, me gustan los hombres. Now Latinos don't really understand the word gay and using the word maricón sounds even worse. <laughs> so the easiest way to say this is to translate that into, I enjoy the company of men. And so she sat there, perplexed, uh, 
not saying anything, and so I was screaming, bawling, and I was like, what do you have to say? So she looked at me really hard, and after what felt like forever, she asked, do you want to be a hairdresser? <laughs> so I said, no, I don't want to be a hairdresser. <laughs> and so she says, well, I don't understand. So I said, okay. So I said, let me try to explain. And so when I said, mami, mira, she said, mira, callate. Shut up. She began to lecture me about how she had given up so much to bring me and my brother here, and how I was being selfish for choosing this way. She told me that I wasn't gay, that I could be what's called a burarón, which is a man who is married to a woman, but has children, but he is gay. And so when I told her that I didn't want that, that I wanted to love a man, she decided she got angry. And so she continued to lecture me for what felt like forever, and all I could really do was stay quiet. And so she kept listening, she kept saying to me, are you listening? And throughout this time I looked at her and I, and I was thinking, wow, here my mom is, all these years, all this time, she sacrificed so much. I thought about my dad coming to America with all his friends on that raft. And here I was, not being appreciative of any of that. And she began to scream, I looked at her and I said, mommy, and she said, what? And I said, do you have any Coke? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>